Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, good evening, all of you. I'm very happy to see uh, so many people joining us here live in the uh, Holland College. And I'm also welcoming all the people who are uh, following online. Uh, my name is Johan Eikmans of the Faculty of Economics and Business. And together with uh, my colleague, Professor Katja Biedenkopf, we, are, we have the honor to host a LIAS working group. So LIAS is the Leuven Institute for Advanced Studies. So we have here a working group on social aspects of uh, climate change. Together with KU Leuven scholars, we wrote a discussion paper on this issue and we found it very necessary to invite international scholars to exchange views and um, uh, the ideas expressed in that discussion paper uh, to have a wider than the traditional European perspective on the challenge of climate change. Now the challenge of climate change and the social, social aspects of that is extremely broad. So we, f we, um, we decided to focus on three very specific workshops uh, to go more in depth. And we had uh, a first of the workshops uh, we had last week in which we talked about the energy challenge and in particular the phase out of coal. Next week we will have a workshop on the very important role of uh, cities for um, uh, the climate change challenge. And this week I'm very happy that we have a workshop on environmental behavior as we know that uh, yeah, in order to meet the challenge of environmental behavior, we need, of course, a lot of technology, but we will also need a lot of change in behavior. And that is why we have organized this workshop today in which we already the entire day, um, our colleague uh, Siegfried de Witte uh, managed that workshop this, after this morning and this afternoon. Uh, and we have a distinguished guest also who will uh, share his views on this very important uh, issue. And I would now like to invite my colleague uh, Tim Smits, who will introduce the speaker and who will from now on uh, manage the evening. <laughs> I hope this is a self-managing team. Um, <laughs> um, so my name is Tim Smits. I'm a professor of persuasion and marketing communication at the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, and uh, together with uh, Siegfried de Witte, um, who apologizes for not being uh, able to be here uh, this evening and who is from the economics uh, faculty, um, we were, let's say, in charge of the, the behavioral part in the, in the LIAS uh, 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 project paper uh, that inspired these sessions. Uh, and we, were, we are ve very happy indeed to have uh, Florian Kaiser here with us uh, for uh, the whole day, well, um, we already had the honor of um, having him in, in our workshop uh, throughout the day. Uh, Florian Kaiser is an, uh, a personality and uh, social uh, psychology researcher. Uh, I, well, that's I, well how you could describe the field, but we learned earlier today that he would have liked to be a behavioral engineer, uh, so he's quite envious that this title uh, is uh, being used in the Faculty of Economics here in Leuven. Um, he has uh, experience in, in a lot of different research uh, settings around the world. I believe uh, your PhD was in uh, Bern, uh, if I'm correct, and then uh, research positions all over the world, uh, <laughs> uh, mainly Europe, uh, uh, Bern, Zurich, uh, Eindhoven, uh, currently uh, Magdeburg um, in uh, Germany. Well, um, I think the rest of Florian's uh, introduction will come from himself and certainly from uh, his lecture. I think you're not here to listen to me, but to him. So, um, may I thank you and give you the floor, please. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> so, um, quite a crowd. I'm very happy to see you all around, although uh, your colleagues already tired me throughout the day. So, <laughs> as an elderly man, uh, you shouldn't expect too much. But after starting low, I have a lot of room to improve. So um, as you learned, um, I'm working in, in Germany, in Eastern Germany to be exact. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, Magdeburg is actually the capital of Saxony, Anhalt, um, a state in Eastern Germany. 
Um, if you know nothing about our university, you should actually keep the namesake Otto von Gericke in, uh, also in rem remembrance because I think he sh is an inspiration for us all, especially when we want to change something with our science. So, but that's enough about uh, Otto von Gericke. You didn't want to hear something about air pressure. So I'm talking about environmental protection. And my, actually my presentation is divided into three parts. And the first part, I want to give a brief definition of what environmental protective behaviors are. And then I want to continue with presenting you one of the most simplest model, models of behavior that could, I could come up with. And then following up from this uh, simple behavioral model, I will present you two particular ways. And I give you only exemplary studies. I can assure you that most of our experiments are actually replicated, but I will only give you two generic models how to change behavior, because there are two fundamentally different types. So let's get started. <clears throat> what is environmentally protective behavior? And if you go into um, environmental psychology uh, literature, you see that Paul Stern actually said that behavior can be defined by its impact. So the definition here is by its objective consequences, the objective consequences of a behavior. And of course, you can be even more specific and say behavior that harms the environment as little as possible or even, and I have actually included this in brackets to make it really clear, relatively speaking, um, might benefit the environment. So I don't believe that human behavior at all is benefiting the environment. Whatever we do, we actually harm it in some way or affect it in some way. That's why I'm saying this is relatively speaking benefiting the environment. So to make this definition a bit more concrete, concrete then what we can say, yes, thank you. What we can say is it depends on the resources required by behavior, the CO2 amounts or the pollutants emitted by behavior or the energy amounts that are necessary when we engage in a particular activity. That's basically the, the background of this objective definition of behavior. So if we continue looking on the objective attributes of behavior, we can uh, find that there are, of course, many ways we can dis distinguish behaviors. We can distinguish behavior by their frequency of occurrence. We can di distinguish behaviors by their monetary costs involved. Or we can even say there are different types of behaviors some that are repetitive, others there are just purchase behaviors, so you have already kind of a classification. Then you have a permanence, something you have to, to do repetitively uh, again and again, or you do it once and then it's done. Or you can speak of figurative costs, which is not referring to monetary costs like loss of amenities or, or a lot of effort needed for to engage in a particular behavior. And of course, you can say there might be behaviors that are only performed by a subgroup of people. So one of the features of behavior could also be the population who is engaging or has the potential to engage in a behavior. So policy making can be the, uh, the politicians are here, the audience that might be, or the the target group that might be of relevance. And of course, you can then continue with this kind of objective attributes and try to build a research program in which you classify this kind of objective environmental behavior. And um, as Beth Carline and colleagues uh, from Southern California came up with, 
the usual typology that we find then is that we can distinguish between curtailment behavior and eff uh, efficacy behavior, efficiency behavior, I'm sorry, efficiency behavior. So on the one hand, you can do certain things less or less frequent, that would be curtailment behaviors. You can drive your car less frequently, for example, or efficiency behavior, you buy an efficient, uh, energy efficient car or whatever installation for your household. That would be the prototype of it. The interesting aspect of this kind of objective definition based uh, or behavior feature based definition of behavior is that we now find even a subjective attribute that seems to come into play here, saying that these types of behavior differ in the kind of motivation that inspires them. So for instance, curtailment behavior might be sensitive to something like people's commitment to environmental protection or saving energy, whereas efficiency behavior might be a purely rational behavior and people do it only to save money. But if we have opened up the door to subjective attributes of behavior, maybe we should go a step further and look at the second definition of environmentally protective behavior. The second definition is also from Paul Stern, actually in the same um, article in which we found the first. Behavior can also be defined from the actor's standpoint as a behavior that is undertaken with the intention to benefit the environment. So a behavior is a means to a greater end. We want to protect the environment and we do that by switching off the lights in this room or not starting an air condition. So this definition is based on a reason that is behind behavior. And so we have a generic reason that we could call protecting the environment. And so people, all of us, could actually be differentially committed to protecting the environment. And so we assume that people differ in this regard quite tremendously. That's not to say that if we take on the perspective of the behavior that it, we can actually recognize instantaneously what is the purpose of a behavior. So I have used this um, as, a, as a description, what I, what I mean with um, a reason. There is a manifest behavior, let's say bike riding, and this manifest behavior can actually be functional for many goals. You can actually protect the environment with bike riding, because, but you can also improve your health status, your fitness. You can actually make your neighbors being impressed by looking right sporty sitting on your uh, racing bike. And you can actually save money by bike riding because it's cheaper than usually take public transportation. So what I'm saying is behavior can be engaged for many purposes. Any specific behavior can be engaged for many purposes. And if we focus on only one of these purposes, we usually only recognize that a certain amount of the variance in this behavior occurs out of this particular reason. And the second aspect that is important and crucial, we have to consider the strength or the importance of a particular reason. The strength of a reason is absolutely critical. And in the future, in my presentation, I will talk about people's commitment to a goal, to environmental protection. What I mean is the, important of the importance of the environmental protection reason or the strength of people's commitment to that reason. That's just an abbreviation for this expression. Now, let's move to the second part. When 
do people actually engage in a behavior? Now I'm coming to the behavior model that I was suggesting. As, and as you can see, it's a, a very simplistic model. It consists basically of two forces. And they are countervailing. What does it mean? It means that on the one hand, you have people's motivation, their commitment to environmental protection as a stimulating, as a promoting force. On the other hand, every behavior has a certain kind of behavioral costs. You know, I'm not referring to uh, monetary costs. I'm also referring to all kinds of figurative costs like effort or um, inconveniences that come with any behavior. And on the other hand, as I said, there are all kinds of behavior that can be means for a particular end to protect the environment. And I have just listed a couple of them, like signing a petition to do something for the environment, to voice a pro-environmental opinion, to ride a bike for one's commute, being a vegetarian, accepting nature protection restrictions, all kinds of things people can do to actually support environmental protection. So these are, in coming back to my definition, these are all possible behavioral means by which every one of us can engage in environmental protection and attain an environmental protection goal. As you can see, the relationship or the behavior can be explained with, with the, these two countervailing forces and we can actually uh, model that in a very specific formula in which we recognize, let's simplify the left part, the probability of engagement for any specific person in any of these pro-environmental behaviors as the difference between the person's commitment to environmental protection minus the behavioral costs involved in engagement in this very particular behavior. And of course, the assumption is that different behaviors have different behavioral costs and different amounts of behavioral costs. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> when there are two countervailing forces, what we expect on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the one hand is that there is obviously a positive relationship between commitment and the probability of engagement in a behavior, which is actually indicated on the right-hand side. You see, with increasing commitment from weak to strong, the gradient uh, increases linearly and we get a higher probability of engagement in any particular behavior. So far, so good. Now, if we just pick one spot where, for instance, the engagement likelihood in a behavior switches from 0.5 to 0.51, it becomes a little more likely and possible that a person engages in this particular behavior. Then we, let's call this the threshold of engagement. The ones that are above the threshold are probably engaging in a behavior. The ones below the threshold are probably not engaging in the behavior. What can we conclude about actors and non-actors here? Some very uh, interesting things. We can conclude, let me move to this side, that actors will on average have a higher commitment level than non-actors. That's a logical conclusion, simply by the fact that people's motivation will actually lead to strengthening their likelihood of engagement in any kind of pro-environmental behavior. So in a first study, what we did is we did actually <laughs> approach employees of the Otto von Guericke University in Magdeburg um, with our questionnaire and gave them our measurement instrument for commitment on the bike racks or the parking lots or at the tram station. 
And so after we verified their mode of commute, they received a particular questionnaire. It was color coded so that we knew which kind of person actually filled that in. And what you see here that the ones who used the car, the non-protective behavior, the non-actors in this terminology, had, as expected, a lower commitment level in comparison to the pro, uh, uh, proactive, protective behavior actors. So the ones that engaged in the environmental protection. And of course, this was also statistically significant. After we had explored the employees of our university, we did the same with our students. This time, however, we made the study a, li a little broader. We included a second university in Germany, the University of Konstanz. And what you see here, we separated now again what we consider to be the pro-environmental behavior. This time, only bike using was considered the pro-environmental behavior, whereas the public transportation was now the non-acting accordingly. And what you see is that on average, the, the commitment level of the protective commuter were actually higher than the commitment level on the non-actor side. But there is a second thing you might notice that University of Constance is raised. So on average, they have a higher commitment level to environmental protection. The, quest the question was, what was the reason? And if you know the topography of Magdeburg, you know it's flat. <laughs> this is really hilly here in co by comparison. If, if you go to Constance, there is this quite a unique situation. The university campus is on a hill. And see what the behavioral costs are. People have to battle up hills. This actually constrains their, um, or it, it requires a higher dedication for environmental commitment. And there, that explains the effect. And what we find is, of course, we have uh, a bike effect using the environmental protective measure and a hill effect, a behavioral cost that obstructs engagement in this particular behavior. So, but there is more. So we have two compensatory forces. These are not only two forces that affect behavior. These are actually two compensatory forces, which means costs can obstruct behavior. Commitment cannot be strong enough to make people engage in a particular behavior. What it means also is that with increasing commitment level, you should find a relative increase in the probability of engagement. You are already familiar with this kind of concept. But you can also see that this kind of um, linear relationship can be on different levels. So if the behavior is actually easy to engage in, the so-called low-cost behavior, then of course the engagement probabilities are on a higher level, whereas when we deal with a high-cost behavior. The interesting aspect is, if we draw now our reference line, what we recognize is that there is a certain if we take one given probability of engagement, regardless on what level, what we can conclude is there are two ways to get there. Either we are strongly enough committed to even overcome the opposition of a high cost behavior, or we make behavior so easy that even a low commitment to environmental protection is actually sufficient for engagement. So this was basically then our empirical question. Is that true? You know, why were we skeptical? Why were we skeptical whether this might be true? Because the literature is full of this kinds of models. 
what does it say? The alternative view that's really quite popular in environmental psychology, even the nudging literature is full of it, is saying a nudge is only effective if the commitment is high enough, or the other way around. If the commitment is affecting a behavior, that is only the case conditional whether we are dealing with an easy or difficult behavior. So the efficacy of a behavior, the efficacy of a force, the commitment or the costs, is a direct conditional function of the other force. And this is actually the, the standard thing that we find in most of the behavioral literature, that we assume that costs and commitment are interacting to have a behavior effect. And as you see there, our model is actually saying, no, that's not the case. It's actually two independent forces. They do not interact. So one of my students, Oliver Taube, with a colleague, Max Vetter, put this now on an experimental test. Yes, this was not a field study. This was an internet experiment, actually. And what they did is they had two conditions. In one condition, our participants had to visit um, a retailer for health foods, which is ecological brands and products, a green shop, if you wish. On the other hand, the retailer was a conventional retailer. I assume there are several in, the, in Belgium as well. Um, so this was the default condition. What does it imply? It implies that the first products you see presented are actually either green products or conventional products. And what is the dependent variable? The dependent variable is the proportion of organic bioproducts in the consumer basket of our participants. So what is the proportion of green products that are uh, caught, uh, bought in this um, uh, retailer's shop? And of course, what we assume is if the default condition is supportive, then of course, we should find facilitating conditions. And that's on the higher level, we find the relationship between commitment and the proportion of green products in the consumer basket. And if we are in a conventional store, then we are on the lower gradient. Again, what we find is a commitment effect. This is the linear trend. And we find a condition effect, which are the two levels of the trend. Obviously, we have no statistical interaction, which would signify a dependence of the two forces from each other. So exactly the situation that we have anticipated. There are two ways to increase the proportion of green products in the wastebasket by facilitating the default condition, the consumer the shopping condition, or by stimulating the commitment of the participants. Now, this was the second part, the most simple model that I wanted to present to you. Let's move on and take this simple behavioral model and look at behavior intervention. What is the traditional way behavior is changed? What are the different interventions that we normally use in environmental psychology, but also in behavior economics occasionally? The, the thing that I would like to point out first is these are kind of randomly picked articles. Uh, there is nothing wrong about these articles. What I want to stress is something in the title, promoting sustainable consumption, or apply behavioral science to promote public transportation. What does that imply? 
what does that imply? We need, dependent on the type of behavior, we need different interventions. It's not we need an intervention for pro-environmental behavior or environmentally protective behaviors. No. Depends in what domain or sector we are. That's suggested by simply saying we are focusing on nutrition. We are focusing on transportation. We are focusing on whatever you like. So simply by the content segregation, we are suggesting there are no general interventions in this field. A little bit more sophisticated is the model that Wes Schultz has actually promoted uh, or suggested in 2014. What he uh, uses here is a graphical representation of the features of the behavior. So if we have a behavior that is more or less unattractive for a person, has no real incentives at all, then the benefits are low or the benefits are high. For most economists, this conception is probably easy to understand. On the other hand, there are barriers to behavior, which I have so far called costs. And these barriers can be low or extremely high, high cost behavior. And what the, the graph actually tells us is if a behavior has certain features, we as psychologists should take different interventions. Again, we find as a, the argument that different behaviors need different interventions. What I would like to demonstrate today is, no, that's not the case. The very moment we define pro environmentally protective behavior as a class of behavior that people engage in to protect the environment, we don't have to segregate these kinds of behavior into e any sectors anymore. We can actually apply very generic intervention strategies. And of course, since we have two countervailing forces, we can, on the one hand, try to lower the behavioral costs of a behavior. That's the example here is we eat eating a vegetarian dish. Let's say this has in a, an average likelihood in any cafeteria of 0.39%. Now what we want, can do is we can actually try to find the handicaps, the barriers behind eating vegetarian dishes and remove them and hope that we can actually attain a higher level of engagement. That would be the first strategy. This means that is one intervention that applies to all kinds of behaviors. We simply have to lower costs. And it's not saying that all costs for all behaviors are equal. We have still to do some research to find out what are the significant costs of a behavior. But if we find them, we can just lower them. I'll give you an example. The very study about um, <coughs> vegetarian dishes we actually did with our students uh, in our Mensa. Again, at the, I, I just noticed we do a lot too much research at, on our campus. <laughs> so uh, what we have here are, we want to find out whether we can stimulate the proportion of vegetarian dishes in one week. Exactly what I had as an as a, as a, uh, example behavior. Can we actually stimulate the proportion of vegetarian dishes in our students they consume in a week? And what we have here is uh, two groups. One control group without any cost intervention and uh, you could say uh, a cost reduction group, which is not exactly true. We promised them two euro for uh, if they chose the vegetarian dish and we controlled for it. You could say a reward of this kind is, is a negative cost. So we reward them 
uh, which can be equated with a negative cost. <clears throat> and what you see is, again, we find a linear increase on both levels with and without reward. Obviously, the commitment to environmental engagement is significant in explaining the proportion of vegetarian dishes in our cafeteria. But it's also relevant to notice that irrespective of the level and the strength of the commitment, students seize the opportunity to get a free lunch. Yes, of course they do. And again, as, as we would expect with our model, again, we have no interaction effect between the two. What is the downside of this kind of interventions? The downside is probably this one. After receiving the reward, the, the following week, the ones in the experimental group fall back to baseline. Right, it has no lasting effect. Who would be surprised in an economy department, right? Right, but some psychologists are surprised because they think if we lure people into engaging in one behavior, they might recognize how tasty vegetarian food is and we, they continue the next week, right? That might be, you know, this was only a one-week intervention. If we had done it for 10 years, maybe we would have been successful, right? Could be. So, but I do, I want to just stress, don't be too hopeful that this kind of lowering costs will lead to lasting effects. It will probably last as long as your cost intervention lasts. So, now, if that's the bad news, let me give you the good news. We can also try to fortify people's commitment to protect the environment. What you see here is, of course, a distribution indicated with a Gaussian curve indicating that people are different in respect to their commitment to environmental protection. Simply, they are, we are not equal. We are not average on a certain amount. We are different in how strongly we try to engage in environmental protection. This is a story, uh, by the way, of one of my former doctoral students, Laura Henn, um, and is published in the Journal of Environmental Psychology. What you see here is, given the distribution of environmental of commitment to protect the environment, we can actually conclude that all the different behaviors, all the behaviors that are means to protect the environment have a certain engagement likelihood, given the average commitment of people, right? And depending on the costs. So what we could say is, if we are successful in uh, promoting commitment to protect the environment, we will be able to promote an entire class of behavior. So we can, if we further people's motivation, that's why I'm so enthusiastic about furthering motivation instead of reducing behavioral costs, is if we are successful in stimulating commitment of the entire population, what we find is actually an increase in all behaviors that are instrumental for environmental protection. Maybe only a fraction, but the cumulative effect will be tremendous. And this is what we would call a spillover behavior effect. If you attain motivation, it will spill over to all kinds of behavior. Wouldn't you want to come in? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. So, what we did is now, we put this on a test as well. We had actually tried to explore where, whether it would be possible to stimulate people's commitment to environmental protection um, in an experimental uh, stimulation and this is before the intervention, this is after the intervention, and what you see here is the experimental group 
has a, a massive increase in their commitment level in comparison to the control group. So obviously, and this is indicated with this statistically significant effect, our intervention to stimulate people's commitment and was, was highly successful. What does that mean? Now, let me explain what does mean in terms of spillover. Let me translate the information that we started with before the intervention into an engagement probability of all the behaviors that we explored, which is indicated with this green trajectory. What it says is there are behaviors with a low with a low cost level and with a high cost level. And we can describe that with a probability of engagement. So when costs are high, the probability of engagement is pretty low. If costs are extremely <clears throat> low, then of course the probability of engagement, regardless of any commitment, will be high as well, right? So if we translate this increase in people's commitment into engagement probabilities, that's the expected effect that we would anticipate, which is indicated with the, the straight line, the black straight line. The gray area indicates a confidence interval around this expected increase of the engagement likelihoods of all the behaviors. And the dotted line is giving you some observed measures of behavior. And what you see is four behaviors outperform even beyond the confidence level and five behaviors underperform. So, and all the rest is actually in the line of our expectation. What we are pretty confident that we could show with this experiment was that we in truly find a spillover behavior effect if we are successfully stimulating people's commitment to environmental protection. Okay, let me come to my concluding remarks. I think I tired you enough already. Um, it will be brief. So I started with a definition of environmentally protective behavior. Behavior that relatively benefits the environment was the objective definition. And on the subjective side, behavior that people engage in to protect the environment would be the subjective, the psychological definition we should actually opt for. The interesting aspect is that we find a convergence of the two definitions at least on a lifestyle level. So, what you see here is one study from Oliver Arnold and colleagues published in Environment and Behavior. And what you see is a weak negative correlation between commitment and the, an the annual electricity consumption. You know, keep in mind that these are extremely dirty data. And I'm not saying this is a, a huge effect, but it's Im at least indicating that the commitment level pays in consumption level terms. And that's what we are aiming for, right? We want to have less impact. And commitment results in less impact. Then I try to convince you with a simple explanation of people's behavior. This is a very simple model that we came up with and uh, on which I now work for more than 20 years consists of two countervailing compensatory forces. And on the one hand, we have costs of a behavior that can obstruct engagement. On the other hand, we have people's commitment to environmental uh, protection. And keep in mind, this is one specific motivation. Of course, we can do this kind of research with another specific motivation as well. Health protection, uh, for example. And given the two forces, there are always two ways to further protective behavior. We can actually lower costs 
or we can add negative costs to a behavior. And these effects are generally specific. Um, they are generally effective, but they are behavior specific. So you can only change one behavior, maybe another one that is highly similar, but in the, on average, you can change one specific behavior. If you are successful in fortifying people's commitment to environmental protection, what you will find is a promotion of an entire class of behavior, and you will find spillover behavior effects, a cumulative effect that I think psychology makes not enough use because such a marketing effect, that would be tremendous to convince people that motivation is a critical variable in behavior change. So before I end, I would like to list some of my colleagues that helped me with, with my research over the years. I'm afraid I couldn't actually list uh, everyone, so I hope you have some questions. <clears throat> If I'm correct, and I'm, now I'm looking at the organization, I'm also uh, having to hand out the mic to people or not. They, they, they yeah, but afterwards, afterwards yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, but I just wanted to make sure that I know all the practicalities, uh, <laughs> because otherwise, uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, Thanks, Florian. Uh, the floor is open to the wider audience, but first we listen to the, well, uh, also distinguished guests uh, uh, of Lias for, uh, for uh, uh, these weeks we are having about sustainability. So, do I just go clockwise here? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm clockwise, sorry. yeah, the, the, this clockwise behavior. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you, Professor Kaiser, for your lecture. It was very inspiring. And I think we have a lot, of to, a lot to debate with spatial planning, uh, considering um, human behavior and especially environmentally protective uh, behavior. Well, we debated a lot today, it was said. And in our debate, we saw that there are not very direct or at least easy to grasp connections between behaviors, engagement, knowledge, and perception. Uh, somehow knowing what people know or, or, or what they perceive is not enough uh, for us to know their choices. Uh, in the sense, it seems interesting that the research uh, is carried out in the opposite direction. So how do we believe, uh, uh, what do we behave in face of choices? So behavior is, uh, is the main uh, aspect of uh, the, um, the research. Uh, even if we know, knowing the why they behave in some ways is not so simple. Uh, in other words, uh, I, I would say that knowing if the choice is about efficiency or reduction, or it's between these two poles is more difficult than observing the choice itself. And then we must ask, uh, is the choice that, that matters, what matters or what lies benefit it? What matters more for us in our uh, researches? Certainly, uh, and we discussed uh, it a little bit, uh, how we behave is very much rooted in values that are collectively defined, and the context or territory, as I prefer to call it, uh, is important to define uh, what are the environmentally protective uh, behaviors and the various possibilities of choices that people have. Uh, of course, I'm thinking here that poverty is in many cases environmentally protective, uh, but it completely restrains the choices that people uh, have. So that's, that's not the answer to 
uh, environmentally um, protective behavior. Um, so, uh, from, from the speech of Professor Kaiser, if I understand it, lowering the costs of behavior is important so that people can engage in environmentally protective practices. And that, that's very important to our countries, maybe, because the uh, behavior costs, they are so high. Especially in Sao Paulo, where I live, the, the behavior costs for doing this transition between a business as usual model uh, of, for example, commuting to a more environmentally protective uh, behavior in commuting is enormous. So we have a duty there to lower, lower these this costs that goes much, uh, um, much far, uh, farther than, uh, of course, just uh, trying to kind of educate or engage. Uh, we are talking about building this uh, options and building these this choices, so then we can maybe figure out how the choices are made. So uh, I think that in this case there is a, a connection uh, between uh, human behavior and especially environmental behavior, environmentally uh, protective uh, behavior. Did I make some, I don't know. Uh, we, and uh, spatial planning. Uh, because if it's if we ha we have to uh, if we if we co if we consider that uh, the possibility of choosing uh, is important, so it's necessary to build these possibilities, uh, and if possible, make them much more attractive than the other possibilities of, for example, commuting or living, etc. And then here I'm thinking about. Hilda and I, uh, of course, if, for example, in our discipline, uh, if we uh, agree that compact city is an environmentally protective behavior to spatial planners, politica, political uh, choices, and etc., we have to build the possibilities for people to be in a compact city and not to be in a very much sprawled uh, city. If you want people to commute by bike, we have to build bicycle lands. We have to make the, their jobs more near uh, uh, from their houses. So there's a lot of spatial planning and actually infrastructure uh, uh, needed to make it possible uh, for people to, to have the more environmentally sound uh, choices. Uh, in this way, uh, I have uh, a question more, kind of more scientific curiosity. Uh, if we are talking about uh, an environment where uh, the choices are very restricted, how can we conduct this kind of um, analysis? Or is it just a matter of what we are asking? For example, uh, I'm, I'm, I was talking to you that commuting in Sao Paulo has very high costs. So if I made a, a, a research there, a survey, asking people, well, uh, do you commute by bike? Mm -hmm. Actually, there are a lot of commutes by bike. I said to you, mostly uh, rooted in poverty uh, um, and no choices, but if I do this, this uh, kind of uh, question, maybe the answer will be, well, I can't, I can't really connect this environmental, uh, environmentally protective behavior to this, uh, to commuting by bike. Sure. But maybe I can uh, relate to another uh, kind of behavior. Uh, so that's, that's my question, how do I conduct some kind, this kind of research, yeah. when I have just a few or maybe none uh, possibility of choice? Um, I think you have just described an extreme case where the base rate of bike riders is, is relatively low. 
And so the one thing that is tricky when you translate it into a research question is, will there be enough people who use their bike for environmental reasons? Or are there other dominant reasons? So what you need is a measure by which you can measure the dominant reason. And what you will find is exactly what we have demonstrated. Even better, if it's a, such a complicated, costly behavior, then the average motivation level must extre be extremely high to be there. I'm not saying it's environmental motivation. Yeah. It could be that they want to save money by using the bike. But I would say they are actually really interested in saving money. Otherwise, and you would find a substantial difference there. Um, so, of course, you need to have a certain sensibility. What are typical measures uh, in certain cultures people engage in to protect the environment. And normally you do not pick the two easy ones because then you need sample sizes of an enormous magnitude to find mean differences between actors and non-actors. On the other hand, you go, don't go for extremely difficult behaviors because there might be different reasons and you find you have basically only the ones in your sample that are doing it not for environmental reasons. And of course, that would be a boundary. Con but this is more the technical side. Uh, your commentary um, was actually something I was um, anticipating because what we, what we usually um, we call this behavior, behavior cost interventions. And you are referring to behavior cost intervention. Another label we could use for it is structural intervention. Changing the environment, the boundary conditions in which people live and make one option more, likely, uh, more likable, um, more likely, I'm sorry. Um, so you facilitate the boundary condition in a way and this is classically, the, that was nudging would describe. But the problem is, the very moment you go for structural interventions, you will have to do a lot of things for many different behaviors, rather than having a, a big splash with a, a fundamental uh, shot on the behaviors. And you have uh, the risk of downsides, um, rebounds of all kinds of sorts. So for instance, in Norway, they facilitated the boundary condition for having an electric car. You know, the, the first obvious finding was people actually bought electric cars on top of the other yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> that was exactly a good thing to do. So okay. thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Florina Kasser, for excellent and uh, thought-provoking presentation. Uh, it's really very exciting. Um, I would like to reflect from my perspective, from my Ethiopia's perspective. I'm from Ethiopia, by the way. My name is Fikadu Bayene. Uh, you, most of you know that Ethiopia is one of the LDCs, least developed countries, with a population of over 100 million and a uh, land size of uh, 1.5 million square uh, kilometer. The main stay of the population is agriculture. You know, agriculture accounts for about uh, 35 percent of the GDP and uh, employs about 74 percent of the workforce. So when you think of climate change, uh, in Ethiopia, we have a very ambitious uh, climate policy. Our NDC is uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 68 percent by 2030, compared to the business as usual scenario. We have projected from 2010 to 2030. So, if we follow the normal development path compared to the green path, so uh, we have a very ambitious policy, but uh, means, means of implementation is very important because it determines the implementation of this, this policy. Uh, I was watching the, uh, closely the presentation on uh, behavioral change. The title is very inspiring. Can we change 
behavioral change, community influence behavioral change. I think I would say, yes, but how? Uh, it all depends on the context and um, you know, the, it needs a location, uh, context specific study. You have to know the, or learn what are the, the interventions that can positively influence uh, pro-environmental behavior. Uh, I was looking at the examples of those experiments. They are very good, relevant for the context in Europe. But if you go to my country or other uh, least developed countries, I think we need a location-specific study to understand first and then to help communities or government or individuals to adopt, uh, first to test, because in order to change behavior, people must first test it. Uh, and then after testing, adopt it, and then sustain it. So before doing all this, I think it uh, is uh, research and uh, collaboration, collaborative engagement, uh, particularly uh, from the developing countries perspective, this uh, collective action is much more uh, influential. Collective behavior is much more influential than individual behavior. For instance, in an agricultural context, if you want to restore a degraded landscape, uh, you have to, all the communities in that area must contribute for this building terraces or other physical infrastructure. So in that case, it's not about the individual cost of behavior and uh, the motivation that requires that matters. You might need to see other factors that might uh, bring positive influence for a common, common good. And uh, my last question is, do you think, do we need adaptive location-specific research to bring a positive uh, pro-environmental behavior? Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'm, let me say I'm not arguing for a naive adoption of any measures that you want to take. What I'm, but what I would assume you, even in Ethiopia, their money matters. So if you put a price tag on almost anything, I would say you can influence Ethiopians as well. But what I'm trying to, to uh, indicate as well is, I'm not saying if something worked in Germany as a cost reduction measure, it will work in Ethiopia. No, you shouldn't be naive. In, in this kind of intervention strategy. You should go there and learn what might be the relevant cost parameters that are important. I, I'm not sure whether I would call that research. I think it's an exploration necessary in advance of having a structural intervention. So as I have to go to Belgium to actually learn what are the boundary conditions here, whether I should promote even more paper recycling or whether I can focus on other things and what are the handicaps here. Of course, we have to learn about the specific boundary conditions in which we want to change behavior. But no, I don't need to learn other intervention strategies. I know what works in principle, cost reduction and motivation stimulation. And yeah, I also appreciate, of course, the remark about the thought provocation. I'm culturally sensitive enough to know that you just said that you don't believe a shit of what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question. So the takeaway uh, message is then that better to invest in motivation than in lowering the cost because there is much more effect if you stimulate motivation. 
But still, then the question is, how do you improve motivation? That, that's still a blind spot and I can't fill in. Can, can you help me? But, but may I uh, shortly interrupt you? Because uh, we still have international guests, I think. Yeah, I she, she already signed to the audition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then the floor was yours. <laughs> May I build on, on, on may I build on the question of Bart? Yeah, sure. Um, because uh, in, can it, I maybe shortly one more practical thing. It might be good also for uh, for Florian um, that uh, when you pose your question that you shortly introduce yourself. That might be uh, interesting. Okay, I'm Jos Del Beke. I worked a lot on climate policy and I'm teaching now at the EUI in Florence. Now uh, there is one question that I wanted to put in addition to what Bart was uh, questioning. Is it not an uphill fight to work on motivation? Because information is spreading around and is confusing the citizen and the consumer. And the more there are studies about electric vehicles, there are also studies about, you know, but are we sure and how? So is the objective that you are, uh, the sustainable objective, is that clearly defined? And if it is clearly defined, is it clear to the citizen? Because there are always conflicting views on, you know, energy consumption of light bulbs. Is it, is it useful or not useful? Are electric vehicles better than, et cetera, et cetera. There's always discussion, sure. and it's good there is discussion, but there is, you know, to motivate the citizen, you presupposes a lot of high educated citizens and most of the people are low-skilled. The masses, you know, where in a democracy that you have to get in your policy and in, yes. your, uh, in, in your sustainable policy are difficult and uphill to motivate because of this flooded information and confusion that comes yes. from that. Thank you very much. I, I think these are nicely fitting questions and uh, I could actually now start a second presentation. <laughs> but I, I think this is really cool. Because you, you address the, the most critical question which I, did, which I did not actually present. How did we actually promote the commitment? You don't want to know. It was so much effort. And uh, it lasted seven months. So, and we borrowed the data because we were too lazy to do it ourselves. So <laughs> the point is that I find it extremely difficult to motivate people and to increase. This was only the first attempt and the necessary piece we wanted to produce to demonstrate it is possible. And uh, yes, as a psychologist, I wanted to have this piece in place just to say, look, what you could achieve if you went for, for motivation. The downside is, you get a lot of critique because some are making references to the Soviet Union. There they wanted to bring people into a certain mindset as well. And so it's a tricky issue whether we want to go there or not. And we need to deliberate on that issue. It costs a lot. It needs really uh, fundamental things to do. And maybe it might involve, and this is related to your question about information, it might involve education, starting early on, and then not only about information, because what we also learned that the perception of information is sensitive to the existing motivation. People only read the flyers when they have a certain level of commitment to environmental protection, otherwise they toss it in, into the paper bin, hopefully, and not in the trash. So. <clears throat> The, the point here is that, and the, you are of course right, the, the average person might not be particularly motivated. But the good news is we just ended um, a longitudinal analysis of the German Umweltbewusstseins, environmental concern uh, study, which lasted for 22 years. And we applied our measurement approach to these data, and what we find is that over these 22 years, we can speak of a slow, steady incline in people's commitment to environmental protection. So on average, people are moving. They are actually engaging in much more uh, support for environmental protection than 20 years ago. But the improvement rate 
is on a such a low level that we never get the target in time. So that's why we have to think, do we want to stimulate it? Because the stimulation is also necessary that people would be willing in a democracy to accept even harsher measures on the political agenda. So we are making kind of studies on CO2 tax acceptance. And I would assume, you know, that you have to have structural intervention that have to follow motivational improvement that accept stricter and harsher measures. And so you have to have an evolutionary circle that uh, involves both aspects, stricter um, protection laws, but a, a populace that is willing to accept stricter population laws. You cannot do without the majority in support of it. So I see there a, a, a combination that is necessary. We have to, and unfortunately, politics is at the moment totally disregarding the motivational side of it. And I think this is a pity because it is so dependent on the motivation what people engage in. It's not only the costs component. So, I'm sorry, I was preaching. <laughs> OK, um, let's keep with the clockwise movement. So, uh, I'm sorry, that side of the audience, uh, last but not least. Uh, well, my name is Hilde Heijn, and I'm a scientific comrade of uh, Luciana Travassos. Uh, also working in uh, architecture and uh, spatial planning. Um, uh, I, I think you addressed already uh, my questions, but still I want, I want to, to, to repeat them. The first question relates to um, how you undertake research. My impression is from my field, architecture and, and uh, spatial planning, that what you do if you do research, that you make a very reductive um, condition that you, you, you bracket whole parts of the reality, you focus on one specific issue, mm -hmm. you have people go, go to either a, an organic supermarket or another, and then you say in the organic supermarket they buy more healthy food, which I find quite evident that they would do that. So you, you make very simple things, um, and, and it seems probably for the benefit of making a good lecture, uh, but it seems to me that these simple things cannot really be, uh, contribute very much to the very complex reality we are all living. Hence questions like uh, uh, Luciana's question. And you would say yourself, well, if you apply it in a stupid way, like in Norway, the electric cars, it doesn't work. So then when does it work? Uh, question one. And related to that, so about this reduction of reality that you have to do in order to make your, your test, your, your, your investigation scientific, and related to that too, um, how do you see the relation between this kind of scientific research and, and, and politics policy? So do you see it as the responsibility of researchers to tell politicians, if you want to reach this goal, go that way, use these instruments, or do you think that it's also our responsibility to, to discuss with politicians about the goals? Because it's two different ways of seeing the role of, of scholars and scientists, I think. Right. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, Just drop it. It's more complicated <laughs> than I thought. I'm sorry, you have, need to help. Help, help me. Yeah, help. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, actually, I'm not so much a, a lab guy as you suspect. Um, I'm more in having a good model and going out in the wild and f collecting messy data. And since the model is good and our measurement tools are good, we find what we usually look for. So um, <laughs> we only use the lab to, to even convince other scientists. Otherwise, we are more interested in changing people's behavior, you know, kind of in reality. So um, I, of course, I have to be frank. It, it, we 
certainly reduce complexities in, in our uh, experiments and field experiments are, are still not always easy to do. And there are, of course, errors that happen. But in principle, I think um, we try to be honest on this part and, and not stay in the lab for what, what we do. The other question is, of course, hitting an interesting mark about relation to politics. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of, of David Hume, actually, in this regard. Um, as a scientist, I'm bound to the is and not to the ought. And uh, there is no way from the is to the ought. And so I'm not actually trying to educate politicians about the goals. Um, I only want to create powerful measures for change. And if they want them, I'm happy to share it them with them. But I'm not here to, to tell politicians what they are supposed to do. So here, I have to disappoint you. I, I do not see myself as a scientific activist. Sorry for that. <laughs> Okay, we now first give the floor to the other side of the room, and um, okay. we can come back. <laughs> okay, my name is Walter Luyten from K. Leuven. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, you argued that uh, increasing motivation is actually preferable over providing some incentive, but you already, in response to the question, indicated that changing motivation is not easy. Uh, if it's difficult, usually it means it's expensive. Yes. If it's expensive, it may be cheaper to do something else that's equally effective. So there also, that's the first part. There also seems to be a limit to changing motivation. You were shifting people, uh, and so that's all to the good. But if it would work perfectly, then everyone would end up with perfect motivation. And that's not what you achieved, and that's probably not achievable. So there are also limits to what you can achieve with increasing motivation. So maybe it has to be combined with other things like incentives. And the third part is, when you increase motivation, I'm assuming that th that is not a permanent change. That would be great, of course, but in practice, it probably, you always have people who sort of backslide. So then it means that uh, there's a continuous effort probably needed, which will make it even more expensive and more difficult. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, if, if I had something that is equally, equally effective as a spillover behavior effect, I'm all ears if you tell me what it is. Um, I, I'm still thrilled with the idea that I can increase the strength of a reason for engagement in people and then realize how that... Uh, uh, entire class of behavior will change. You know that it, there are so many um, environmental aspects in almost any consumer decision involved. And if I bring every one of us to every time consider a bit more the environment on the issue, I think this is a tremendous powerful effect. But you are right. Um, it means costs and financial costs, I doubt that there is, you know, my answer to your first point is, I doubt that there is anything comparable in its effect, efficacy. But you are also saying that protective motivation can be stimulated, but it might actually hit the ceiling some, someday or another. You know, according to my understanding of reasons, um, the, your commitment is basically infinitely uh, increasable. You know, as a, as a former long distance runner, I can tell you, you can actually train as hard as you like until your bones break. And then there is still another guy who is even more committed than you used to be. So uh, that's the, from, from the side. Yes, even our measure is actually in an extreme case infinite positive, infinite negative. We are not saying there is a, a, a perfect motivation in any case, even thinkable. O otherwise, we had a, an absolute scale. And we are only measuring on an interval level. 
And then, yes, you said the argument about permanency. The good point, you know what I think for this part, because I obviously forgot to mention, and um, that's because I have not brought the slide of this one study with me, is you saw that after the intervention in the cafeteria, when we seized the reward, uh, people went, fell back to baseline in their consumption of vegetarian dishes. We had another study in which we explored people um, two years in regard to their environmental commitment, uh, commitment to environmental protection. And what, we, what you do if you have no intervention between two measurement points and 24 months in between, you have basically an even level, no mean differences in the motivation level, and you have no effect, so the, the measurement error attenuated correlation between the two data points was 0.99. So the motivation is extremely stable when you do not try to change it. And I think this is encouraging for in the long run. But as I said, I still in the process whether I should advocate uh, motivation promotion as, as a sensible tool for societies, but I think we have to consider motivation as an important boundary conditions of people's engagement. At least this we should do. Steph Brostam from economics from this university. I already raised a question to you before the lecture. But <laughs> I will not come back to that. Uh, thank you for this very inspiring uh, model and lecture. Uh, I also believe that in the end, what is important is that the link between motivation, uh, po uh, political decisions, and then maybe political decisions that will imply a certain number of costs and uh, say taxes, subsidies, etc. But I have a different question about your, this motivational uh, uh, perspective of motivation, uh, intrinsic motivation. And I think in economics, I don't know too much uh, about uh, environmental economics, but let's say there is a lot of literature on something called warm glow. Yes. And the warm glow tells you, actually the warm glow has been studied, is the idea that I feel good by doing the, the good thing. And I think we are <clears throat> something very close to what you're uh, exposing here, uh, intrinsic motivation, has been studied intensively uh, in the States for giving to the, uh, giving to the poor, uh, to the good deeds. In the US, you see much more giving to the, the good deeds than we do. And the main difference is that we have a government that takes over that role. So my question is, do we not risk that the government, by being very active on the environmental side, and maybe I'll, I'll take care of everything and I'll subsidize everything, uh, and then there is no, much less need for environmental, uh, environmental behavior with, uh, between codes? That was my question. Thank you. Yes, I, I certainly would caution against the idea that we should um, totally rely on, on structural changes of any sort. You know, that, that's what my original point, that what kind of cost intervention, if you make basically the pro-environmental choice the more, more attractive one, I would expect that you find a lot of indirect rebound because if you subsidize the right behavior means there is more money in the population. More money in the population means more consumption. More consumption is usually not to the better for the environment. And so the, the risk is if we lose sight of people's intrinsic dedication to we want to do something for the environment will open up the dam for this kind of rebound again. So I'm, I, th I feel we, sh we cannot uh, simply rely on structural intervention as such. That's, that's my basic concern. I'm not saying we should not do and facilitate wherever it's sensible. Maybe we can look, as, as Florian Lange has suggested, 
to look on particular behaviors that are particularly important that we affect them structurally. Yes, then we might create laws that um, ban or suppress certain of these activities dramatically. Yes, that might be a sensible thing to do. But I would warn uh, to try to create a society where the sustainable option is the easiest option all the time. Um, I don't think that will actually save us in the long run. Okay, we have one more question from that side. Yes, uh, Jos van Mierkbeek. I'm uh, an economist from this university from 30 years ago. Uh -huh. uh, I'm also involved in the governance of the Leuven Institute of Advanced Study with a number of colleagues here. Um, thank you, first of all, for your, uh, for your lecture. Um, when I think about motivation and, and grasp back to, to my education, especially when it concerns the collective good, uh, you see motivation bump into something that is called the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, if you have to act collectively to reach something better, then yes. it's always better to let your neighbor do the work and, and, and sit back and, and, and watch uh, yeah. as an individual. Um, it seems to be, and I was struck by that, by the 22-year study of increase in motivation to, do, to contribute to the, to the environmental goals and to the uh, environmental case, that that is evolving so slowly seems to be a confirmation of, of that rule or of that, uh, 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 the model. Um, and it raises, uh, it raises the question to me, and, and I've spent most of my career in, in outside academics and in, in, in business life, um, shouldn't all the money, first of all the conclusion could be the environmental problem, climate change, is never going to be solved based on individual behavior or collective individual behavior. So shouldn't then all the effort, energy, and funding of governments go into an institutionalized solution or in a technological solution rather than trying to motivate or influence individuals mm. that in the end, as the study has proven, only, and like you said it yourself, reaches the goal or risks to reach the goal way too late. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'm not sim simply. This was a descriptive analysis of of past data, population data in, in Germany to describe if we don't intervene, it will be a very flat increase that we have. But let me use your example of the prisoners' dilemma because we have published one article on on a, a common dilemma game. And um, since economists are so happy about um, the redefinition of rationality, um, and they link it to information processing, uh, and Kahneman and Tversky research, and, and link it with uh, the, the fallacies of people's information processing, let, let me be old-fashioned economists and say, look, rationality has something to do with outcome expectations. And so if we sacrifice utility, this is absolutely irrational. And isn't that exactly what we want of, from people who should do something for the environment, sacrifice amenities, comfort, even money? to protect the environment, act irrationally. Think about it, it's horrible. And we did a, a prison's dilemma game, as I, I promised I would mention. And uh, if you play it with five persons, and you have a commons of, let's say, 10 points, or 10 kilowatt, then you have a fair share that people should not exceed two units per person, right? And so what you expect as an economist that you have a learning curve approaching two of whatever the, the common resource is behind it. What we did find is in one group that was highly committed, they were actually falling below, significantly below that line and they were requesting less what their fair share would have been. So they are willing to sacrifice for the environment, even utility. As an economist, you shouldn't believe that. 
<laughs> as, as I would say, you know, that was, was for me one of the strongest arguments to say there is a motivation effect. This is a part person experiment. <laughs> so I think all economists would agree with you that in part with five persons it would work. People cooperate or whatever, in the end they believe that things go on. But put, let's say, you see every day on the road uh, 100,000 cars. Yep. Okay. I, to, to, to tell the truth, you know, I, I do admit that, that I seem to attract um, PhD students of a certain kind. Um, I don't know why, but <laughs> I'm, te I'm telling you, in, in, I get actually looked up if I order a non-vegetarian dish. And I have difficulties. They are so um, interested in doing something and they are so committed, I would assume they rank relatively high, it's certainly higher than I do on this commitment scale. And they are day in, day out, in my opinion, sacrificing so many things. And the answer to your question is, yeah, there is a majority out there who is not behaving irrational in this regard. But there is already a quite a substantial minority who is acting somewhat irrational from from an economic point of view, and I have some in my lab. <laughs> okay, we uh, go back to this side of the room. I think there's already two questions, so you can go ahead. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I'm a student. I studied philosophy and now uh, law. Um, you spoke about the spillover. Um, to other kind of behaviors. And I was wondering if there could also be um, a spillover in the sense that um, one person or a few motivated persons could influence and motivate other people. Um, so there may be like collective um, actions um, resulting from that. I think you have to explain me a little more. I'm sorry, maybe I didn't get. Yeah. Um, so my question is, like, if you would be able to motivate some people, um, would those people and the actions they do then motivate other people and oh. create a spillover effect in that way? Oh, you mean a social norm and intervention? Yeah. yeah I, you, can, you can do that, of course, but I wouldn't consider that a motivational intervention. I would consider that a cost intervention. Social norms are part of the boundary conditions, so to speak, and you can uh, increase the pressure on people by confronting them with a majority belief, with a majority action, and of course it becomes then more tricky and complicated for them to violate the behavior that the majority is, is actually suggesting to use. Um, yes, you can use social norms as a cost intervention. Thank you. So, Johan Eikmans of the economics department. I, I was wondering when you were drawing this, uh, the, the graph with your horizontal and vertical dimension, mm -hmm. that seems to suggest that you consider them independent. And there is also a lot of research about intrinsic motivation and financial motivation, that if you start giving punishments, for instance, for undesirable behavior, that it might destroy intrinsic motivation. So that would suggest that your dimensions are not independent. And I was wondering about that when you presented it. Uh, don't you believe that? <laughs> that they are possibly interacting or what? As, it, as you might figure out, I don't believe in this kind of interaction. Okay. So but, and, and to be, to be honest, uh, overjustification, or as they call it in, um, in economics, crowding out is actually a phenomenon I do not see so much substantive evidence. And as a father, I can tell you, I was actually violating this principle. I was paying my daughters for having good grades in math. <laughs> and one is now... Uh, an econometrist, and uh, one had both of them has, have finished their uh, German um, high high school uh, um, access uh, with a math um, what is it called honors course. So I think I didn't recognize any crowding out. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know what 
Sure, I, I'm not. I'm not saying, but you, you are. You are implying. <laughs> I will keep that in mind for my next life. <laughs> no, but the the point is, um, we have no strong evidence that there is an interaction between between a, a cost component and and uh, the motivation component the, um, although the literature is full of it all the classical nudging literature is speaking of nudging only work when the commitment is not too excessive right it's, you find that on and on in all kinds of papers but i see only weak evidence for that i see relatively strong ad evidence in our research for non interaction very happy with your answer in the comments because that means you can continue with finance. <laughs> 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 Hello, uh, Peter Rijmakers. I'm from the Public uh, Governance Institute, and my research is on nudging uh, in a public policy context. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to thank you for the very inspiring uh, lecture, and also it got me thinking because. I was also wondering about these uh, two, what you call, uh, intervailing, uh, and for me first, interdependent forces, but you present them as uh, independent forces, and you have the behavioral costs yes. and the motivation. So from a nudging uh, perspective, would that mean that you would classify nudging always into the behavioral costs, with yes. the consequences, as you showed, that you have only short-term effectiveness, you can only work on one specific behavior, and you cannot spill over to the motivation uh, yes. force, motivational force. So, is very that nice, your... very nice summary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so in a way, nudging will never uh, nudge you to to contemplate or to elaborate on or to uh, motivate you more. No, oh, you know, as long you can, of course, keep um, the change in the structure. Uh, for infinity in some places and that long the notch will be effective. I, I have no doubt about it, but I do not expect that it will actually in any way instigate uh, an, a change in, in motivation. It might be, you know, kind of you get a fringe benefit. So like uh, after 20 years, you really start enjoying vegetarian dishes when they are subsidized for that long. That can be, you know, kind of, uh, we have the, all these, these strange things um, that happened after a, a certain duration in place. But I think that needs mo some more empirical work, you know, kind of how long is the minimal effect size until we have some coloring of the motivation on top of it. Okay, I have a follow-up Sure, and if you, if you are interested, I have actually a paper in which I uh, in, uh, write about nudging and the cost sent me an email, I'm okay. happy to respond. I will definitely do that. Uh, so nudging will not help us here for this uh, protective uh, environmental behavior, uh, but the, from a, a government perspective, then you take the other side of the spectrum, so you have the nudge and you have the regulations, would all these same features apply also to them, so they are not, cannot build on intrinsic motivation and they always stay in the behavioral cost you know, force? Yes, um, it's also a structural intervention and, and you find when you look in the nudging literature, um, I, I think Toller himself mm -hmm. was so strict in saying your yeah, financial incentives and rewards are no nudge. Yes. Why not? You know, that's simply because you, you give something a qualitative label. Uh, doesn't say that's one underlying principle that, uh, that you know. And then there is a lot of um, discussion about what are the effective forces behind notches. My suggestion is look at any structural intervention as a cost parameter that a change in cost parameter and that necessarily that for, there follows uh, uh, the, the, the engagement likelihood will, will change as, as a subsequent uh, condition. Legal regulations are a little bit out of the, now they are also structural changes, but think about you have to emplace them and if they are extremely harsh measures, they forbid a particular behavior. And you, when something is forbidden, of course, all kinds of psychological side effects occur. Mm -hmm. 
So in principle, yes, a regulation is, is also considered a structural intervention and, and could be considered in, in the class of notches. But at the same time, um, I would also hear you are provoking resistance uh, on a totally different scale. And if you um, exclude that in, uh, from your view, I think you are running also in other problems that, that might not be so good for what you have in mind as a politician, I guess. Okay. Thank you very much. But it also means that you know, a government cannot nudge citizens and it has difficulties to regulate. It's a very challenging. <laughs> yes, it, it can <laughs> regulate. And you know, the appeal of nudges and structural intervention is as you are leaving people a choice. I agree on that part of the nudging uh, discussion. Of course, that's exactly what we simulate. If, if I offer you to euro for a vegetarian dish, you are not forced to, uh, you can still follow your, your preference. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is, um, of course, a much softer way to interact with people and, and a sensible way to interact with people. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Not sure. I actually do have two questions myself that I want to ask you for. And my apologies. Uh, um, well, I have the mic, so. <laughs> uh, um, first is when you consider all well that, that large group of costs that you um, that you describe. Um, I get a kind of a nagging feeling with that idea of cost because if you well. If your intervention then, for instance, albeit a short-lived one intervention, that might be a reasonable one if it's, for instance, has a longer duration. So if we can nudge people into buying an electric car, well, that's gonna make sure that the next five years they're gonna ride with an electric car. So <laughs> that might be a good idea, maybe still. Uh, but if we consider it from a cost perspective, then we must also acknowledge that it's a subsidy for the converted. Um, I mean, if um, let's say if for now 30% of new car buyers would already buy an electric car, then your subsidy will increase that to 35%. But you're well, you're, you're subsidizing 30% of people that were already planning to buy it, and subsidies are bad. It's something that you <laughs> just said yourself. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying subsidies are no, bad. Well, from a, an efficiency perspective, you could wonder, like, should we then, for instance, tailor all these interventions that we only use the money for interventions that on a personal level are leverage points? So that, that's, let's say, the, the first question. Um, and the second question that I had is still w with regard to that, let's say, longitudinal or iterative perspective. Um, it's based on the idea that motivation is a psychological construct. Which means that it's also in part construed. It's something that, well, it has trait characteristics, but also some state characteristics. I mean, if you ask me now about my motivations for X or Y, I have to think about it. And part of what I think about is my past behavior. So couldn't it be that nudging-like or, well, let's say, cost-focused interventions can actually help people understand that they are basically motivated without them really acknowledging it beforehand. Um, referring to actually a couple of things. So, for instance, you now see that in, in Belgium, for the first time, we have 20 year old, uh, the 20-year-old segment that is um, eating somewhat less meat than beforehand. We are massively consuming too much meat still, but for the first time, you see some changes in dietary patterns, but not a lot. And I guess that a lot of people actually don't notice it themselves that they are le eating less, um, um, less meat. So maybe we should just make people aware of that and then show like, well, you might think that you need this much motivation, but you're already here. So you're quite close to, so maybe there is, a, there is somewhat more positivity in the motivation domain but we do, we're in lack of a motivation psychologist here, I think, uh, than you suggested. So I'm wondering whether you want to share that positivity or not. <laughs> Trying to wrap up positively, um, Ben. 
you, you found a very positive twist in the end, but uh, <laughs> I think you want to ask whether uh, we prompted them with our intervention to give a certain pattern of responses on our commitment scale. No, 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 no. That's not what you no, asked? No, not at all. I really think of it as, could you use it as an intervention to increase motivation? <clears throat> yeah, but you know, um, the first aspect I, that comes to mind is, um, I didn't talk tell you the intricacies of the way we measure motivation actually and uh, the model is relatively strict and you cannot really cheat on the answer on the patterns and so um, I doubt that simply by placing people in a certain experimental condition that already affects what we measure as their commitment in in any respect i i can really not imagine and in some of the experiments you know it doesn't even matter whether we measure commitment first and then do the experiment or whether we do commitment uh even much later and so um we treat it as a trait because w without an active stimulation that uh, there is no there is almost no sensitivity of that measure. At least that's our experience. You know, it's, it's, it's really com comparatively stable to many things that I know. Um, and of course, what you said that um, I'm, I'm not against financial rewards uh, in, in any way, but I think we should use them wisely so get get the most out of the buck and if you have uh, the inclination to reduce co2 emissions then try to uh, get as much as possible in this regard um, thinking uh, on the other side you know we have still in germany um, regulations that actually support the commuting distance that people commute. You know, you get an extra tax incentive if your commute is further away than 25 kilometers from your workplace. How strange can that be? You know, I think, is that sensibly in, um, used money for, for, uh, for the climate? Yeah, no, that's not the case, but there must be a good reason for politicians to use it. So. The point I'm trying to make is politics is not science. And if I want to change things, I can tell you how you could do it. I did this in several interviews when it's about vaccination. I could tell them a lot of things they could do to increase the base rate of people vaccinated. But I knew exactly that the politicians wouldn't enforce them because that would actually mean quite some... Uh, fall back on, on the, the populist side, that they were not particularly happy if, if they would actually fall back. For instance, one suggestion was just if people are not vaccinating themselves for the greater good, you know, that's fine, then just let them pay uh, for their own illness as well. That would be the logical consequence if they are not willing to share the burden of the community, then don't why should you expect the, the, the community to share your burden with you? Uh, I think this, this will be the strongest measure of, of all the two, but I knew exactly when I made this suggestion that will never be a, a policy in Germany. It was only a policy in Singapore, as if, if, uh, if I recall. So, sorry for this elaboration on another issue, but... Okay, thank you. Um, and still we ended up with COVID. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it took long. <laughs> it took long, it took uh, the whole day, yeah. Um, thank you, Florian. Um, I think uh, the reactions also uh, testify to the fact that uh, you, you gave an inspiring and thought-provoking thought, uh, talk, so uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks also uh, for uh, the audience and for the organizers. And, um, but what Annie is uh, saying, like, wrap up, there's, we can have a drink. <laughs> so, part of an experiment, so we don't have to lose participation in the drink. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
and there will be cameras monitoring you. Uh, so. <laughs> Thank you.